Uh, welcome, everybody. Good evening. Uh, welcome to another of these uh, WISH webinars, WISH, the Wits Institute for Sport and Health. As many of you know, you've been with our webinars for some time now over the lockdown period uh, anyway. We're a network of clinicians and scientists in the greater Johannesburg area uh, with expertise in, in all aspects of sport and exercise medicine. And it's a collaborative network. And, and one of the things we're trying to do is to collaborate with colleagues and experts around the world. And today is a great example of that and a very exciting program for us this evening where we have one of our uh, top local researchers in a specific field together with an overseas expert. Uh, and we're really looking forward to the talks delivered by both of them and the interaction and the questions from, from all of you out there. So please do send your questions through the uh, question and answer facility on Zoom, and we will do our best through the course of the evening to filter them and, and get them across to the experts who are out there. So these webinars form part of WISH's academic offering, and we're delighted to welcome our colleagues from the South African Sports Medicine Association who are joining us nationwide as well, uh, together with colleagues from around South Africa and the world. One of the things we've done at WISH is establish a number of interest groups. We have 26 of them, and tonight's presentation is actually a joint hosting of two of those interest groups, the Child Sport Interest Group and the School Sport Interest Group. So you're going to hear less of me tonight and, and more from the chairs of, of those two groups who I'll introduce in a minute. But I do really want to thank, before we go on, our partners in this venture, Lita and Asino Company, a pharmaceutical company, who's given a wish a grant to help support programs such as this. And we're very grateful for their support through the rest of the, this year. Uh, it's really allowed us to offer these webinars and support the technical aspects that allow us to deliver them. So I'm going to end off there and I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Robin Saggers, who's a pediatrician and he chairs our uh, child health interest group uh, from a sports perspective. He will introduce the first speaker and then Hine Brandes, who's a physiotherapist uh, with an interest in school sport, will join us a bit later and the two of them will run the rest of the program. So we welcome you again and we hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, like you mentioned, I'm a pediatrician. I'm not a sports medicine um, specialist, but I obviously have an interest in children. Um, I have an interest in children and sport as well. And I think that we've got a very interesting session lined up and we'll go a little bit more into the outline of that in a moment. Like John said, I'm the chair of the ch children, um, the, the child sport um, interest group. And my colleague Hene is also joining us. She's the school sport um, interest group leader. So Hene, if you can say hello to everyone. <laughs> Great. Um, this, the outline this evening is going to be two um, experts in their fields. Uh, firstly, we've got a local researcher and she is um, based at the South African Medical Research Council and WITS Developmental Pathways for Health Research Unit. So I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Catherine Draper. Catherine has a background in psychology and the social sciences. She obtained her PhD in public health in 2005. Her research interests include the development and evaluation of community-based physical activity interventions for children. Catherine is particularly interested in the preschool age group and her current research is investigating the relationship between physical activity and cognitive development in early childhood in low-income urban and rural settings in South Africa. More recently, this research has included screen time and sleep in this age group. So what we've got this evening is a presentation by a leading local expert. She is talking to us about the physical activity in the, in the young child, particularly in the, um, the ages of birth to um, preschool up to the ages of five. And then later, we're gonna hear from an international expert who's gonna talk us, to us more about the older child, so from um, about the ages of six all the way up to 18. 
And then a little bit later, after some Q&A, we're going to discuss um, early, early sports specialization and the debate that rages around that. So Catherine, um, if you can start by sharing your screen, I'm going to hand over to you and um, we're going to see what you have to say to us. Thank you for joining us. Um, we can see your screen. You're still muted at this point. Great, thank you. Right. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity and thanks to those of you who've taken time out of your evening or your day, whatever you are in the world um, to attend. So um, as I mentioned, I'll be talking about our movement behaviors and early childhood development and we'll share some evidence insights and interventions from South Africa. So just to clarify when we're talking about movement behaviors the four main behaviors that we are referring to are physical activity, um, sedentary or sitting behavior, sleep um, and screen time which is a form of, of sedentary behavior and in the early years there's an international move towards understanding these as 24 hour movement behavior. So it's understanding kind of the full spectrum or full range of, um, of how children move and go about their days. And it helps to provide a more kind of cohesive message um, when, we, when we're talking about these. So just that just kind of frames things up front. Um, and why are they important? So I, I'm not going to go into the real specifics here. I have at the end of the presentation, which I'm happy to to share included a long list of some of the current references that provide evidence for this. Um, but just to say that these movement behaviors in the early years have been linked to healthy growth and physical development, um, as well as cognitive, social and emotional development. And why these are really important in the early years is because these behaviors tend to track through childhood and from childhood into adolescence and adulthood. So a child who's active or has a healthy amount of screen time in the early years is likely to, to carry that into later childhood, adolescence and adulthood. And the evidence certainly supports um, starting early with these behaviors and establishing healthy trajectories as far as these behaviors are concerned. And um, I am gonna mention screen time specifically. It's something I'm um, passionate about. Um, and probably don't need a huge amount of evidence to show that the science actually sometimes can't keep up with the technology when it comes to screen time and children. So I will be talking a little bit more about this later. Um, but we really do advocate a cautious and conservative approach when it comes to screen time for, for really young children. And I've included a link there for an article we published um, some time ago around around why this approach is important. But really, um, in, in terms of the whole child's development, these movement behaviors play a role in promoting health. Um, when we look at this age group in terms of physical activity specifically, we also look at gross motor skills. And these refer to object control, locomotor and balance skills. Uh, some of you might be familiar with them being referred to as fundamental movement skills. And this helps better to explain that these form the foundation or the building blocks for future physical activity and for sport specific movement patterns. And this is relevant for school sport, for talent identification and for youth development. Um, and the evidence also shows that these um, gross motor skills in the early years can be predictive of physical activity and fitness later in childhood and adolescence. So it's important to get those established early on as well. Um, they have been associated with physical activity, so better gross motor skills with more physical activity, and poor gross motor skills have been associated with unhealthy weight and higher screen time. But many of these studies are, are often cross-sectional in nature, so they point to these bi-directional relationships. So which comes first, a child who's more physically active because they have better skills or because they have better skills, they're more inclined to to be physically active. So it's important to be aware of that as well. Um, typically, and most of this research is um, based on um, data from higher income countries or high income settings is that these skills are typically influenced by socioeconomic status, by environment and by instruction. So the assumption is they don't just develop, but they actually need to be 
I'm taught in a way and reinforced. Um, but as I'll show some of the evidence that we've collected in South Africa, this can depend quite heavily on the context. And it does point to the fact that some of these factors might have a different influence at different ages and in different settings. And so in our work, we've really tried to fit this within a more developmental perspective. Um, and when we talk about younger children, we tend to steer away from talking about exercise in early childhood. Sometimes that conjures up pictures of making little kids do push-ups or run around a field, but rather see how all of this activity takes place within the context of play. And this includes both structured activities, so games were typically led by an adult, and unstructured activities, which we often refer to as free play. And it's really important that whatever the structure is, that these activities should be fun, I mean, enjoyable, non-competitive at this age, and also inclusive. And so I'll just briefly just point to the nurturing care framework, which some of you may be familiar with, just as a way of, that also kind of frames the, the kind of work that, that we've done. And you'll see that movement behaviors and motor skills form you know, part of many, many um, aspects of early childhood development and what promotes health and development at this age. And, um, and it's important to, to consider how do these the behaviors and how do these skills actually fit in um, with other aspects of early childhood development as well. And so I'm going to probably spend the, the, the larger part of my presentation just presenting some of the research that we've done in this area. Um, I like to start with a story and where it began because it all fits together quite nicely. So about um, nine years ago, we did a, a my first study in early childhood. It was a program called Little Champs, and we collected data in Alexandra Township in Johannesburg, which many of you might be familiar with. And essentially what we found was that this program where kids just came to a community center once a week, played some games and went back to preschool actually had a significant impact, not only on their gross motor skills, which is what we'd hope to see, but also actually significant improvement in their school readiness scores of children who participated regularly in the program. And for me, what this really sparked was how could physical activity and motor skills play a role in actually helping children set them on not only their best health trajectory in early childhood, but their best trajectory for their early learning and education and what role could um, physical activity and motor skill development play in that. And so what this um, led me to then pursue was particularly focusing in early childhood and the preschool years. And then we realized that no one had actually measured gross motor skills or published data on gross motor skills, physical activity, and how these relate to things like adiposity and measured screen time or sleep in this age group. And so that's where our research moved. And in, in terms of that, we were really interested in certain contextual factors. So we know what was happening at preschools, what was happening in the home environment, and how might this be different in urban versus rural settings, given that we have a really good mix of those in South Africa. And so we started um, with some higher and low income, middle income settings in Cape Town. And then just, you can see on the map, Cape Town's at the bottom left, and we went as far as we could away from Cape Town to um, an area called Bushback Ridge in Mpumalanga, um, where Vitz has a research unit there. And we started a number of studies looking at some really basic things like height and weight, accelerometry to measure physical activity, a test of gross motor development to de uh, measure motor skills. And then we have a, had an observational system that helped us to see what act activity was taking place in preschools and what was the context of that and also did some qualitative work. And just in very brief summary, um, we spent a lot of time in these preschools, not only doing the observations, but just generally being there for data collection. And um, it was quite clear that across um, all income settings, there was very little intentional physical activity promotion or gross motor skill development. Um, and that kids across all settings were more likely to be active if they were outside. Um, they spent a lot of time inside, um, and for many of the urban lower income settings, it really had very little space to play, so it would spend more time indoors. Um, and the, the rural preschools had more space 
but there wasn't a whole lot of learning um, happening. And in many cases, they lacked basic amenities like electricity, running water, toilets, and those kind of things. And that in the lower income settings, that the qualifications of teachers were often quite low. And in rural settings, it was not uncommon for teachers not even to have finished high school. So in terms of what we learned around their physical activity, uh, the recommendations, which I'll go into more detail later, is that um, the children of this age get 180 minutes a day, including 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And as you can see, most of them met um, most of the guidelines. They had an enormous amount of physical activity, um, boys more active than girls, and actually um, rural preschoolers were actually really active and urban high income um, preschoolers were actually the least active. Um, but the coolest graph that we have to date is this one and it just shows you how we've whoops, mapped the different activity levels across the day in these different settings. And so you can see the, the green is urban high, uh, the blues the rural and orange is urban low, and you can just see how, how different the day looks. And this really pointed us towards understanding that the context of this activity is really important. So for instance, you can see there's this big surge in activity in the evening, in a, which is a, in an urban low income setting. And so that means kids are playing outside in the street and at night, um, and that's where they're getting their physical activity. So it's important to know that even though the children are meeting recommendations and exceeding them, it's maybe happening at the expense of their safety. In terms of their gross motor skills, uh, you can see here that just over 90% were scoring in the average and above average range. So physical activity wasn't an issue, gross motor skills wasn't an issue. And really interestingly, again, the rural preschoolers who were getting no instruction at all on these kinds of skills and barely had any equipment like balls and that kind of thing. Um, and the poorest qualified teachers actually had the best gross motor skills. And so this has really raised a question for us that in our settings, do these children at this age really need equipment and instructions to develop gross motor skills? And what are the other activities or other contexts in which they're active that are helping to develop these skills? In terms of screen time, this was done using a parent questionnaire and the, the recommendation for this age group is less than an hour a day. Um, the urban high income kids, would fewer of them were actually meeting this guideline. It was really low in this rural low income setting, partly because they didn't have electricity in the village where we did data collection. So that would account for not many functioning screens. But what was quite concerning as well is that in these urban high income parents, half of them thought that screen time would not affect their preschoolers' health, um, which is quite concerning given that the evidence around this um, is, is growing. And sleep, um, this is another behavior that we've looked at and the recommendation for this age group is that they get between 10 and 13 hours per day, uh, per 24 hour day. Um, and in the urban low income settings, again, showing that there's some issues there around um, or identifying where we need to perhaps target our intervention efforts is that in these settings, there we found often late bedtimes, a lack of bedtime routines. And obviously, um, in terms of the population density of some of these areas, many children were sharing rooms, if not beds, um, with other family members. And we found across these settings, that shorter sleep was significantly associated with higher BMI for age Z score, despite these high levels of physical activity. Um, and um, compared to the rural and urban high income children, the urban low income children had um, later bedtimes and wake up times and a shorter um, 24 hour and, 20, and nocturnal sleep durations. And so these graphs just show within that range of 10 to 13 hours, what it looks like for a week, uh, weekend and um, for, for both for combined groups. And we did another study in Soweto that kind of further highlighted the need to, to target um, urban low income settings. And so what this really shows is that when you just take their nocturnal sleep, so what just what they're getting at night, they're kind of just making it into the recommended zone 
once you add their very long nap at preschool, they're kind of more safely there. But the problem is, is that these children then are then using that nap at preschool as a way to actually get enough sleep. And once they go into formal schooling, they're not going to get that nap. And the concern then is that they, they just kind of continue that sleep debt. And our qualitative findings, and this was really more focused now to where do we intervene and, and what are the kind of key issues and priorities. Um, we found just in general that um, the parents, caregivers, teachers were generally positive about these behaviors, but that um, the child development was much more salient than something like physical health itself and certainly more salient than um, obesity prevention, but there was still quite a lot of gaps in knowledge, particularly around screen time. And some of the other qualitative work we did in other rural areas identified that this was an issue, um, but that all of them were quite receptive to intervention. Um, some more recent work in Soweto um, with, with parents um, is that many of them feel that there's many environmental factors that constrain um, the choices that they make. Health is not always the guiding principle for these decisions and obviously things like unemployment, poverty um, play into that as well. Um, but that there seemed to be this common um, belief that they wanted their children to learn, to develop, to feel happy, to feel loved. And so that interventions that actually bring in these different developmental components and that actually promote positive parenting, nurturing care, um, and healthy habits could actually be more successful. And kind of parallel to, to this, and Robin mentioned at the beginning that we've done some work around cognitive development, we got interested in something called executive function. I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail for reasons of time, um, but it's, it's a key aspect of cognitive development in the preschool years. And there has been some research around the links between this and physical activity, but it depends on what type um, and not getting enough sleep is um, also associated with, with poor executive function. And so we did a study in Soweto and went back to Bushback Ridge, again with preschool children to see how do these things all kind of relate to each other. Uh, we found similar levels of physical activity and gross motor proficiency, but unfortunately didn't see any association between physical activity and executive function, but did see some relationships with gross motor skills. So this reinforces that the type of activities and perhaps the context is important. Um, for cognitive development, and this is something we are um, still looking into. So at around this point, we're saying, okay, well, where do we intervene? Do we train preschool teachers? Uh, do we work directly with parents or caregivers? Um, and we opted to, uh, to first go with the parents and caregivers, but to make this shift to a more holistic focus on development rather than just physical activity. And we knew that no funder was going to give us money to improve physical activity and gross motor skills when we've already shown that these are within the healthy ranges. So we developed an intervention called Amagu Asakula, which means treasures that are still growing in one of our local languages in Zulu. And this was a community health worker delivered intervention in the home. Um, and it was intended to be delivered over six sessions where there were various activities in the sessions to not only promote these um, healthy behaviors, but also to develop things like fine and gross motor skills to promote early learning and to create these opportunities for nurturing interactions. And we piloted this in a township in Cape Town called Inyanga with an NGO and we also piloted it in, in a primary healthcare setting um, in Soweto, both with community health workers. And although we found that it was generally acceptable um, to, to caregivers, they had mostly positive perceptions about it. In terms of implementation, it was much more feasible with the NGO partnership than the through the health services. And that's something we um, trying to still figure out the best way to to have an intervention that can have effect, but that's also scalable and aligned with, with what's already out there. Um, the other big um, area of intervention that we moved into is to develop these South African 24-hour movement guidelines. And we don't have any guidelines for any movement behaviors in South Africa. So we were very excited to create the first ones. Um, 
but uh, this is also kind of responding to this low awareness around the importance of movement behaviors and all the benefits that it was associated with. So it was a whole um, long process. We had a consensus panel with wide representation, wide stakeholder consultation, including with national government and at a community level. And at the end of 2018, we launched these guidelines and we made a nice text document, which our government partners said no one would read. And so we made a picture as well. And this infographic has done the rounds all around the country. Um, and we were really excited um, to have translated this into all 11 languages. Can't fit all 11 nicely onto one page. So this is only nine. Um, and these are available um, printed and electronically. And if anyone would like copies of them, you're most welcome to, to get in touch with me. And we had a really fun launch of the guidelines at the end of uh, 2018. And we were very generously hosted uh, by the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund in Johannesburg. And this was also with funding support from the Laureus Sport for Good Foundation um, and the DST NRF Center of Excellence in Human Development at WITS as well. But when we launched these, we realized this is just the beginning of the dissemination. And we tried to get our printed guidelines distributed as widely as possible. But we really wanted these to get into the hands of caregivers and anyone who works with naught to five-year-old children. So we worked with a kind of train the trainer model and we got hold of um, details of different NGOs and ECD organizations. And we basically said, we're gonna have workshops and invite anyone who's interested um, to hear about the guidelines. We made it a two hour workshop um, so that it didn't take up too much of the day. And in September last year, we had workshops in seven of the nine South African provinces. Uh, we provided as many printed resources as, as we could. And we also um, collected some evaluation um, data which I'm not presenting here, but is a, is a work in progress at the moment. Um, we had a wonderful PhD student from our research unit, Gudani Mukoma, and we literally flew him around the country to all sorts of areas um, and settings to, to do these workshops, which um, overall were really a success, but have given us a lot of insight into how we need to continue this work um, and continue to follow up. We also partnered with a company called Creatrix to give us some marketing and creative sizzle because they said the South African 24 hour movement guidelines for birth to five years is not really a great marketing title. And so they came up with this name of our campaign called Wazam Twana, um, referring to the South African early years movement guidelines. And this is a phrase in Zulu, one of our local languages called which means come here child. And it really helps to encapsulate the philosophy of the guidelines, which is essentially to create a connection between young children and their caregivers to engage in behaviors that promote their health and development. Um, and the logo is intended to go alongside the infographic and it uses these shapes and elements and colors from our South African flag to do this. And I, I don't have time to show it, but um, Creatrix also wrote us a song that tells us about the guidelines. And so I'd really encourage you to click on this link and watch the video with the song. Um, it's just, it's a, a pilot at this stage of uh, just another creative way to get the message out. And we are planning on doing more work in the future to take this forward. Um, I was also involved um, in the development of the WHO Global 24 Hour Movement Guidelines for the early years. And this process happened kind of in parallel with the South African ones. Um, and while they contextualize slightly differently, the recommendations are all the same. And they've also adopted this 24 hour approach for the early years. And linked to these WHO guidelines is a, a study called Sunrise, which is the international surveillance study of 24-hour movement behaviors in the early years, to essentially see how many children are actually meeting these guidelines. Is it different between boys and girls, urban, rural, and across different countries? Um, and are these movement behaviors associated with any other aspects of development? So it involves assessing anthropometrics, accelerometry for physical activity, motor skills, executive function, and a parent questionnaire to get at some of the other behaviors and perceptions. 
So South Africa is one of the first um, pilot countries for Sunrise. So it's currently in its third phase of piloting and it's got just over um, 30 countries involved. Um, our urban site was Soweto and our rural site was an area called Sweetwaters near Hilton and Peter Maritzburg and KwaZulu-Natal. And again, using slightly different um, cutoffs, we found that the kids were definitely exceeding um, the physical activity guidelines. Um, almost 84% were meeting physical activity guidelines, less meeting sleep, less meeting screen time, and only 26% meeting all three. And in a different um, set of findings to our previous research, that the, the the, ch the rural children, although they were more active, they actually spent more time on screens, um, but the vast majority of, of children were on track for motor development. And uh, we found that executive function was negatively associated with screen time and gross motor skills were positively associated with physical activity. And just uh, one aspect that the parent questionnaire brought out was how are the parents using the screens in their home? Um, and you can see this lighter blue one is on most days um, or every day. And you can see that for many of these things, there's quite a decent chunk um, of the parents who are actually using screens to educate the child, calm them down, keep them busy, using them during the bedtime routine. So this is really highlighted for us the importance of any parenting strategies that we work on need to help parents um, uh, find ways to to interact with their children that doesn't necessarily rely on a screen and give them some um, feasible alternatives. And um, quite recently, in the midst of um, COVID and the lockdown, a number of the Sunrise um, country investigators, um, led by um, our colleagues in China and Australia, to actually put together a commentary um, around movement behaviours in COVID nineteen. Um, and it was a really great range of authors so getting across different countries at different types of lockdown, different um, restrictions in terms of activity, different time, types of access to digital resources. So some kids that could play all sorts of games along um, with, you know, with the TV or the internet, but, but many children who um, were really limited in terms of what access to activities they had, access to space. Um, and I guess what it really highlights um, is that screen time, again, has is, is become a really difficult behavior to manage in, in this pandemic. Um, and it's, it seems, given, given the pressures that parents are facing in terms of homeschooling and job losses, food insecurity, to now um, kind of really hammer on about screen time recommendations seems quite insensitive. So it's going to be really interesting in the, um, how these behaviors change during the pandemic. And there are some of the Sunrise countries who had the opportunity to collect some, some data around this. So some more of that should be coming out soon. And that is it from me. So obviously all of this work is reliant on a number of amazing students, um, collaborators, and many funders who've who've made it all happen. So I've included my contact details there and really happy to take any questions. Fantastic, Catherine. Um, thank you very much for that informative talk. Um, I found it fascinating. I like the way that you, you brought all the aspects of your many research projects together. Um, can we touch a little bit more on the 24 hour movement guidelines? So firstly, I understand that it's not an easy thing to go about making some guidelines like this. Um, what was the sort of process involved? I know you took a lead from certain other countries. If you can talk us through that a little bit. Yeah, um, we were really fortunate in that the, the kind of early years movement people is, is quite a, a collegial bunch. And so Canada had done the first set of guidelines and so they helped Australia Australia helped us. The UK were doing theirs at the same time as us. So we helped each other and we were all on the WHO group together. Um, and the WHO were very kindly allowed us to use their systematic reviews for our guidelines as well. And then we added some local evidence um, that wouldn't have initially made it into the systematic review. So it's definitely a, a collegial and team effort. Um, the, the first thing was getting some funding. So <laughs> These, I know now we, we, 
we've learned how to do things non face to face, but um, it was uh, seen as really important to have like a face to face meeting of the guideline group or the consensus panel. So that, you know, that those kind of things um, take funding and to have a research assistant who could be kind of dedicated to work on that. So, and then I think what the really important thing was, we're making sure that whoever we had in the room um, really represented um, the kind of full breadth of stakeholders that we'd hope to support or adopt or promote these guidelines. So, you know, many of these initiatives are, are, are come from academia, but, you know, we need to work with government, we need to work with practitioners, with pediatricians, with occupational therapists, um, with some sports people. So we try to have all of those different kind of disciplines or stakeholder groups represented. We were really fortunate to have uh, someone from the National Department of Basic Education who landed up being a massive champion for us and kind of opened a number of doors for us in terms of um, getting things through and, and in, um, allowing us to do some national government consultation on the draft guidelines. Um, and then it's also figuring out how we talk about things, you know, and how we, how we have these discussions and um, the language that we use and kind of the strategies that we decide on um, that need to be um, feasible. And I think importantly, you know, this is not an academic exercise because if it was purely academic, we'd, you know, publish our paper and then say, pat ourselves on the back and say, great, you know, look, we developed these guidelines, but the real work is making these relevant and getting them out there to the preschool teacher in the middle of a rural area, making it understandable for her, making this something that she would want to promote, or this is a poster she would want to put up or she'd explain to her caregivers right from there to, you know, government representatives who feel like this is something we could include in our one day, the road to health booklet or something like that. So, um, so getting that representation makes it really important if you want this to be more than just an academic exercise. So we really want to make a, make a difference. Fair enough. I, I, I particularly like lots of the names of the studies and the, the fact that you, you do go to um, uh, places that can help assist with um, preparing the infographics and things like that to make it more accessible. Um, I would like to touch on a couple of things that you mentioned. Um, you spoke a lot about uh, sleep and obesity. Um, I think in our country, we've got an increasing burden of obesity, which then has, has further effects. And this, I think the research is coming out more and more that this, is, this problem starts in early childhood. Um, you mentioned sleep about it. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on some of the challenges that I think a lot of um, children in this country adults as well perhaps may be feeling with regards to getting adequate amounts of sleep? So I, th I think if, uh, you know, the first thing is the population density. So if you think of how many people are in a household, um, so even in a, for argument's sake, a brick and cement house in Soweto that, you know, looks quite decent from the outside. When you go inside, you might find that there's three generations of people sharing a double bed, you know? So it's three or four people. And um, to, to then say to a family, well, the child needs to go to bed at this time. You can go to bed at that time. The TV that's on in the room where you're sleeping must go off at this time so the child can get to sleep. And, you know, all of those kind of things, you know, you're not just adjusting things in the household that affects the child, you're adjusting things in the household that affects the whole household. So you've got to get them to stop watching generations or whatever's on late at night um, so that the child can get to sleep. Um, and so that becomes a family decision, just, I guess, like, you know, if you're changing dietary behaviors, it's more than just an individual decision. Um, so I think for us, the first step has been to really highlight why sleep is so important for their development, that they can do better at school, that they can be awake um, and, and concentrate better. Um, so it's helping them to see what's, what's the role of sleep, but then saying, well, what are what are some of the simple things that you could change um, and just conversations you could have around shifting some of these evening habits that the family has that impact the child. And I think what was 
enormously encouraging when we piloted Amagugu Asakula in, in Cape Town is that we really pushed reading to the child at bedtime instead of being on the screen. And even though it was a small scale study and we kind of got a small number of people to give us feedback in a focus group, the response was really positive and then it, they said it was possible and actually the child eventually, once they did it a few times, the child preferred reading. Um, and our Sunrise study has shown that only about one in 10 parents are actually reading to their child every day. So this is something else that we can promote, that it's a quiet kind of calming activity which young children need that's preferable to screen time and that has all sorts of other beneficial um, well, all sorts of other benefits for the child's development kind of emotionally and socially as well. So, so it's about also giving alternatives, but then if parents say, well, we don't have books, then we've got to be able to kind of respond to that as well. So, so it's, it's making suggestions or recommendations that are really contextually relevant and feasible and then understanding what resources are actually out there um, for parents to access. So there's things like the Nalibali initiative, which puts reading resources into the hands of parents and preschool teachers. So it's helping them to access those, or maybe there's a book library in their community or something like that. So, so just kind of saying the recommendations and um, not really understanding the context in which these things might happen is important. And I think once those... I'm not sure I understand. Ooh. Someone's talking to me. Um, I think, I think that watch. Be... <laughs> <laughs> Siri doesn't to... understand. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so it's just making um, making these recommendations, but understanding the the context as well. And when those healthy habits start to become part of the family, then the parents might say, "Oh, if we go to bed a little bit earlier as well, then we get a better night's sleep as well." Or maybe older children in the household also start having more of a bedtime routine, and then you can see how these things track. But if you suddenly sit with a teenager who's got a terrible sleep routine, who's addicted to their screen, it's much more difficult to kind of redirect that ship than kind of set it on the right course early on. Very nice. Um, you brought up the, some, some of the tips that uh, one could use. I think there's lots of discussion and your article in The Lancet brought up the issue of um, COVID-19. Um, in the context of children, lots of um, schools, creches, centers for early childhood development are not open. Are there any tips or any suggestions that you can make towards parents um, who might be having to look after their child um, while still working from home. Um, what, are, what are some things that, that are maybe practical tips that people can use during this time? I guess in this time, I mean, getting movement behaviors to the top of the priority list is, is hard enough under normal circumstances. So now when serious unemployment and food insecurity and uncertainty about everything is kind of occupying people's space, um, you know, really pushing the movement guidelines feels um, kind of a bit um, insensitive to that. But I, so I think what is really important is that the children feel secure and that they feel loved in the midst of this difficulty. And I think in many ways, their emotional and mental health becomes more important. So, you know, practically, in terms of how to promote that, like are there things that can be done to promote that aspect of health, but in an active way. So make, and again, it's these everyday little choices to say, well, I, I, I need to just spend some time with my child to just see how they're doing, reassure them, um, you know, should I put on a TV program or should I sit and tell them a story or read a book and sitting, you know, with them, on your lap, reading a book, telling a story is going to be more beneficial for their development than plonking them in front of the TV. Um, you might have things to do. And so it's easier to plonk the child in front of the TV, but in terms of what's, what's going to give the child the most benefit is to make a healthy choice in that moment about what activity they're going to do. Could you go outside and, 
or go for a walk with them, um, even if it's for 10 minutes around the block or something like that, and say, well, this is now quality time together. So it's, I guess, choosing those quality interactions, but is there a way to make those um, healthier from an active point of view? Um, and I think more than ever, like now getting good sleep, you know, sleep is associated with emotional regulation in all ages. You know, we all um, lose the plot a bit if we don't get enough sleep or if we don't sleep well. So to deal with the stress of what's happening, um, you know, emphasizing getting an early bedtime or having a routine, I think, is, um, is really advisable, not just for young children, but for, for all children as a way of kind of providing some stability in this, in this time. And I guess if you're going to send them outside to play, <laughs> put a mask on and <laughs> make sure they do it safely. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your presentation, Catherine. Um, we are going to move on to our next speaker. Uh, we may bring some questions back to you at the end. Um, Catherine mentioned in her talk that the early childhood years are the building blocks um, of um, physical activity. And now we're going to move on to a bit of the older age group, and in particular um, from about the ages of 6 to 18 in adolescence. Um, and we're going to introduce to you our international expert um, dialing in from the United States of America, Prof. Angela Smith. Prof. Smith is an honorary clinical professor of orthopedics and pediatrics at the Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Prof. Angela Smith is a pediatric orthopedist by training and an Emeritus Fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. She is the past president of the American College of Sports Medicine, as well as a previous elected member of the International Federation for Sports Medicine. She has extensive experience in pediatric orthopedics and sports medicine. And um, although she's now retired from clinical practice, her focus has shifted to developing collaborations that utilize her skills to promote, help and optimize physical activity and fitness throughout all age groups, uh, particularly through the use of the built environment. Um, so we welcome Prof. Angela Smith, and we look forward to what she has to say about um, movement, physical activity in the older child. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> Thank you, Robin, from uh, Maine in the US at the far northeast corner of um, the United States. So I really loved Catherine's discussion about taking the evidence base and moving that straight to the people who need it. And Catherine, your infographic was marvelous. I'm sure I'm going to be stealing that. I think that was just really superb. So here we're trying to get more directly to the practitioner who's going to then be taking this information to the um, individual. And what we're going to be talking about are things that, and let's see if we're going to share this correctly, things that um, will allow you to very directly, sorry, we want to go a little bit back from that. I think this is going to be the quick way to do it. There we go. Um, so that we can talk about in an interactive way, how you're going to then help your own patients. So this isn't so much direct to your children, but to the practitioner as to how you can take things to the children. And what we're going to be talking about are a few things in particular. So I'd like to share with you my own 10 commandments, so to speak, of medical care um, that are as follows. First, you obviously want to learn critically because your own knowledge is the basis for your interaction with your patients. You want to listen carefully because the history is going to lead you usually about 90% of the way to the diagnosis. It's obviously critical to observe clinically because the thorough observations are what give you that solid differential diagnosis. Then of course you want to develop your hypothesis and diagnosis from listening, looking with tests when appropriate. Explain, now we start getting really critical, what you're thinking not only to the family, but to the patient. And in my practice, I was often speaking to two-year-olds or four-year-olds, and the family will understand it, but speak so that the small child can understand it as well. It's critical, of course, to teach. And I find that the things that I've taught 
to the patient, even if it's just one element of that possible solution, that that's often the only thing the patient tells me later that they recalled, not what all the other people told them. Maybe they're just telling me that because they know that's what I want to hear, but um, I think it may be true. Love your patients, love your team, love your profession. You have the opportunity to create your own professional setting, your team, your interactions, your diagnoses, your care plans. Always give of yourself. And most importantly, when you're giving, always give hope. So these are my 10 commandments. And the ones we're going to be discussing the most today are about how to learn critically, how to read critically as you're educating yourself that you're going to take that evidence to your patients or your clients. Of course, the first part of our talk is going to be on clinical observation. And I'm gonna make this be as interactive as it can. Normally, we're in a big room where everybody can be interactive together and I can watch what you're doing and you can see what I'm doing. Um, so if we badly fail at this, let us know and we're gonna to try to make this work for everybody at home on Zoom without my sticking my feet into the camera. Um, but with luck, we'll show you some pictures that let you do that. I want you to be able to learn how to teach some of these things to your patients. And again, throughout, please just re be remembering that you always want to be giving hope. And I think Catherine said that very, very well. So why do we even care about alignment? Well, of course we want to be minimizing injuries and improving performance. Posture is going to be really key and we're going to be discussing this a lot. But remember that every patient you're seeing at this age, like this 15 year old dancer who was at that time living away from a home in England at the Royal Ballet School, and she's now a medical student having graduated summa cum laude from a very prestigious um, university, having ended her dance career because of an acute injury. So everyone, even if you first see them at age 10, as I did this little girl when she showed up in my office with, in a wheelchair because of bilateral Achilles tendonitis, Everyone is a person who may well go on to doing really superb things, and she's probably going to be completing this circle. So what injuries might be avoided by this proper posture? You'd be amazed. Maybe intercrucial ligament tears, knee extensor mechanism disorders, posterior tibial dysfunction, bunions, maybe. We'll talk about this. What else might be prevented by using proper posture? spondylolysis, shoulder pain, stress fractures, elbow injuries, neck pain. Yeah. And you're going to see a lot of slides of skaters and dancers in my talk. And I realize that there are very few figure skaters in South Africa. We love it when we see the South African flag represented at the World Championships. Of course, you have wonderful dancers. Um, but I'm going to show you a lot of pictures of these because they have extremely high training loads in hours, even at the age groups we're talking about. They participate in their sport year round. They have to have extreme flexibility as well as extreme strength. And they have extreme jumping and landing loads all the time. They also have a very high level of body awareness. So they may be very responsive to what you have to tell them, even at a very young age. So we're going to be talking about posture and alignment. We're also going to be talking about movement patterns, carrying a little bit forward the gross motor skill development that you heard about from Catherine, and now saying, how do you turn that into very specific movement patterns, some of which may be acquired automatically and some of which may not. We're gonna start at the bottom. We're gonna start at the very bottom, your big toe. So if you aren't already barefoot, please take off your shoe and sock and stare at your foot. So here is the forgotten big toe. Now your feet may look sort of like this, maybe a little skinnier, maybe a little wider, and maybe you're going to find that the big toe is not aligned. It's sort of over there. So I want you to see if you can make your big toe go there. Maybe you have to pull it over using your other big toe. Maybe you have to pull it over using your finger. Maybe you find that by doming the instep, by actually bringing your instep to where it's higher, making sort of a dome, that the big toe pulls in medially. This is really going to be critical as we go forward because this is the base of all our interactions with the whole body. So you want to be also working through the ball of the foot. Now press your heel into the floor, 
then the middle of your foot, then the ball of your foot, and then go right up to your toes. And you'll feel how you work through the ball of the foot. So it's positioning the foot under your knee, and it's also walk, working through the ball of the foot and all the way through the toes. So one of the very early bits of work that John Marshall did um, was looking at ACL tear prevention. And he found that when he taught this three-step stop to his basketball teams, that their incidence of anterior cruciate ligament tears dropped to zero. Doing a three-step stop, so this is a video that doesn't play well, but you would see that this person who you can see is perfectly well aligned right now, that she actually goes but it dum as she stops. She's staying forward on the toes. She's bending her knees. She's landing softly. Does that remind you of any other sport? We were back doing tennis just a minute ago, weren't we? Yeah, and in tennis, the weight is always forward. And in tennis, anterior cruciate ligament tears are extremely, extremely rare. Good food for thought. So here's that ready position. And you'll notice that not only is her weight forward, but one can hope her knees are pretty well over her toes and her right side is left side, maybe not ideally. Here's what we mean by knees over toes. This is a young man who's recovering from a fibular stress fracture. And you can see that he's a little wobbly, but you can see him trying to dome the foot. This is his better side. See how he domes that foot as he goes down and the knee stays right over the toe, right in line with it. That's what we're after. You can try that out yourself and see. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more. So this is a skater, um, a skater who went on to be an international level skater. Um, but at this time, even without her skates on, she could not align. You look at this weird position and say, what in the world is she doing? Can levering just to stay upright? Well, this is the up close version and you can see that her foot has rolled over. She's a little bit pronated. Her knee has gone into what we would call a parent valgus. Her hip has internally rotated. She's sticking out her other leg just to try to balance herself upright. Um, and it's off to the side rather than being straight behind her. So what's happening is that she's using her subtalar joint in a way that's not working to compensate tibial torsion. Now this girl on the right side does still have some residual tibial torsion, so you can't correct everything, because you'll see that even when she holds her foot upright, that the kneecap points inward a little bit. So some people do just have a little bit of tibial torsion, even when you hold the heel in a neutral alignment. But a lot of people can fix this entirely, and everybody can fix it some. Here you see this again, a normal person, but letting her foot roll in a little bit, and the kneecap goes to where it points inward. And you can call this true valgus. You can call this dynamic valgus. It's really internal rotation of the hip that's happening because the subtalar joint was allowed to roll in and the foot everted. So practice holding your hallux into that medial position, the foot domed, and your knee over your foot. So here's Katie in her bad position. Here she gets to where she can align much better. But now she has to put on her equipment and all of a sudden she can't do this very well. She can do it on two feet. She can manage to keep straight, but on one foot, she can do it just a little bit. But as soon as she tries to get in position, you can see that foot roll in again and she gets into bad position. So she eventually can manage to get a little better, but that's the point I'm talking about. So what happens with jump landings? In person, I usually hear a whole audience cringe when they watch this. Um, the next two little girls, this little girl and one other girl, are skaters who came from hundreds of miles away. So this is why I was able to spend time videoing them. I don't have this kind of time to spend with every patient, unfortunately. But you can see how wobbly and how unsure this whole situation is. This little girl had had two years of physical therapy for various problems with her hips and back. And so her family brought her from halfway around the country to see me. So she keeps talking to her family in the doorway. And we've talked about some exercises to try to fix this. And she can fix it when she's just standing still, but she can't quite fix the landing position when she's trying to jump. So she tries now to do the whole thing without jumping, bending the knee, keeping the foot straight with the knee aligned, 
she lost the position. So she's getting her core position, holding her shoulders down, bending her knees, just bringing the foot straight back, trying to keep that right knee directly over the foot, and then doing nothing but turning the heel inward. And now she can attain a nearly perfect position. But she couldn't do that 15 minutes earlier. Fortunately, she had the strength to be able to do it because she'd been through two years of physical therapy. We got one last one here. I'm not sure if we're going to show all of it, but it looks like she's trying just one more time to do it now with the jumping, I think. And she still can't do it, but she knows where to go. So when we look at anterior cruciate ligament ruptures, we run into this question. Is the problem that there's a poor biomechanical pattern both in the pivoting and in the jump landings so that the knee doesn't bend with the knee landings and the pivoting and also you get this increased knee apparent valgus, which is also decreased hip abduction, decreased hip external rotation. So this is a very old video that Mary Lloyd Ireland, an orthopedic surgeon, gave me a long time ago. And watch what happens with this girl. She blows her ACL, this gymnast. Now, when you watch this, you can watch slowly and you'll see what happens. Watch that right leg. And you'll see that already her foot was turned out. She lands flat-footed and in valgus. And you can see that exactly. Now, we're not going to watch the other people on this video, but we're going to try to pick some pictures that I pulled out of this. In fact, you can see that she never really has much of a flex knee and ankle, that she's off balance to start off with. And she lands very, very flat-footed. You can also see that even as she's running to start her tumbling pass, she's not in good alignment. You can see that kneecap pointing forward and the foot pointing outward. So maybe she had some pre-existing problem there. She's not like this young set of tennis players who are learning right from the get-go how to try to get their knees over their toes. This little girl's pretty well got it, this one's thinking about it. This one's trying pretty hard. Left side's pretty good. This little girl is just hyperextended and not making it at all. So you want to end up with this position over the balls of the feet, knees pointing in the same direction as the feet. And we'll be talking a little bit later about the proper curvature of the spine that you also want to be seeing. So here again, forward on the feet, knees over toes, nice curved back. So as we move up a little bit, you're going to see that this champion skater actually has no focal lordosis. The lumbar spine is extended over a long area. That's going to become important. You'll see that lumbar lordosis can accommodate or can compensate for a lot of turnout. So somebody who doesn't have turnout may end up just having to arch their back. But while we're discussing what's going on with the relationship, of the lower extremities to the spine, you're going to see that poor posture can be the cause of hip snapping and clumping. It is not all femoroacetabular impingement, which is what we've heard for the last five years. So you can have the iliopsoas or the iliotibial band snapping across a bony prominence, sometimes causing a painful bursitis, and sometimes it can be very difficult to tell whether it's that bursitis or whether it's really FAI. But it's always worthwhile, in my opinion, to start with some posture and gait training and stretching and core strengthening, because you may find that it, the problem was really what one young athlete asked me at a meeting that he was just helping his father out at. He said, you know, I've always wondered, was it the physical therapy that I did after my surgery that made the difference, or was it the surgery itself? So there's no question that some kids are going to need to have things done surgically, but certainly not all of them. So here's what happens with the iliotibial band snapping across the bony prominence of the greater trochanter. The iliopsoas snaps across the iliopectineal eminence. And here you can see the bursitis that can occur. So this is a girl who it's actually her ITB snapping. And you can watch this happening as she flexes her hip a little bit. You can see this from the front as the same thing happens. And this is her ITB. You'll often have this described to you as my hip dislocates. Snapping hips. This is when she's got a little bit too much lordosis. 
trying to correct the lower doses and she's trying to hold a little more level. You can see from the waistband what's happening. And here you can see the, again, the before picture on your left and the after picture on the right. Let's play those two again if we can do that. Let's see if I can make both of those happen. They won't be at the same, but you can see how little the waistband on the right moves, but how much it moved on the left. Remember that lordosis can compensate for poor turnout. And so it's important that a dancer or anyone who requires doing turnout to be able to feel and find the little short external rotator muscles within the hip. So when we're talking about posture, it can certainly cause a problem in the lumbar spine. A lot of these are imaging techniques we don't use anymore, but it's great that we have these old ones. So this is spondylolysis, that Scotty dog collar. Here's the Scotty dog, here's his ear, his eye, snout, front leg you can't really see, there's the back leg, there's the tail. And somebody who has like this diver, a really great ability to stretch out the posterior elements of the spine is going to be less likely to have this kind of problem than someone who has a fixed lordosis. So I'd like you to stand and by your mirror or get your small children and have them bend over forward and look at them or look at your partner or look at your friend. If you're an adult, you probably can look just like this diver. If you're a 14 or 15 year old, you probably are going to have a fixed lordosis. Pretty impressive. Seems to, to go with about 10 or four staging, 10 or three staging. It's really quite remarkable. So when we're teaching a gymnast, for example, we want to teach them how to decrease their lumbar motion so that when they're doing a back handspring or a back tuck, that they're minimizing that and they're using their maximal shoulder extension, their maximal hip extension, while decreasing the lumbar lordosis and also increasing the core strength that's holding the forward abdominal muscles together. So here's a soccer player. You can see the increased uptake on this bone scan from a long time ago. You can see the gap on the CT scans. A little bit hard to see. This one maybe shows at the best, this very established gap. And this is a person that seem to have perhaps a recent component to it, although you can see that there's some established component, but this one looks perhaps a little bit normal, a little bit newer. So this particular soccer player did not want to do anything except for have physical therapy and a brace. He wanted to stop his sport because he tried everything else and it didn't work. He stretched the tight hip flexors, stretched his tight hamstring, strengthened the core, corrected the anterior pelvic tilt, <clears throat> and he finally got, after about six months, um, he was able to actually get a fair amount of healing across this, and he would be pretty much pain-free. Um, he was afraid to try his sports without the brace, and sometimes we find that's the case. We have to actually wean them out of a brace that, of course, isn't stopping the lumbopelvic motion, but it's acting as a reminder, in my opinion. I'm next going to show you a 15-year-old competitive figure Skater. Notice they're all 15. By the way, that little girl I showed you at the beginning, the girl who became the ballet dancer, she was 15 when she had a spondylolysis, and I saw her because of that. Lots of tears, but eventually it healed. So this competitive figure skater had to stop singles because the triple jumps were a problem, switched to ice dance, but he couldn't lift. Um, he began to compete very well, got a new partner, competed on the Junior Grand Prix circuit, medaled, was doing quite well but he had this very established spondylolysis. Not much was going to do to heal that, so it was a matter of controlling symptoms. The chance of this getting to heal was about nil, and in fact, it didn't, but he became symptom-free and was able to do these kinds of maneuvers, which I'll suspect that most of us on this call could not imagine doing. So let's move up just a little bit, but this is still using your core. Long time ago, Jimmy Andrews, who's a famous shoulder and elbow surgeon in the US said in his Southern accent, you can't shoot a cannon from a rowboat. And it took me a long time to figure out what he meant. But what he was talking about was that you have to have a strong core to be able to then deliver a strong impact, whether it's throwing, tennis, cricket, whatever is going on, you have to be able to connect the floor to the ball. 
it does require a lot of control. And you'll see that this control is not only coming from the core, but it's coming from everything we talked about, from working through the ball of the feet to having the foot and the knee aligned, to then being able to take that force all the way through the core and then deliver it to the ball and land in a well-controlled partial squat. Don't forget that shoulders must be flexible. The whole body has to be flexible. And if the scapula isn't moving right because of core problems or because of flexibility problems, you can get impingement, biceps problems, stress fractures of the upper humerus, and problems at the elbow. So don't forget, that can come all the way from the feet. Think whole body. So how do you get good posture? Well, if you're a dancer, you just keep staring at yourself in the mirror until it looks right. You want to be aligning things properly. You want to have good flexibility to be able to attain these positions of good posture. You want to be able to stretch out your iliopsoas. You want to be able to stretch the rectus femoris, which also crosses the hip and the knee. Two joint muscles are the problem. Another two joint muscle, the iliotibial band at the side. The hamstrings also crossing the hip and the knee. The quadriceps crossing hip and knee, familiar refrain. But we get then to the gastrocnemius, which crosses the knee and the ankle. The soleus, a one joint muscle, but we want to be sure that is solved as well. And you'll notice here that for him to stretch, he ends up getting a very flat footed posture. He's not doing that foot. Keep the shoulder rotating. And also remember that you need core stability even at the very young ages. So the little children, this is a six year old gymnast just learning some exercises. She has pretty well on some, but look at her lumbar lordosis on this one as she struggles a bit. She's really struggling here to try to do it one footed. Now she's losing this foot alignment as well. She manages a little bit better here, two feet. Here she does pretty well because she's used to doing this as part of her training. One hand, not so much. Look at that now, nice round spine. She's a little girl still. She hasn't gotten that tightness in the posterior elements. She can rotate. She can hold things, staying very flat. So you, you can learn that at a very young age. But of course, the older athletes need to have better stability as Kat Arbor shows in these illustrations for her book, Ice Dynamics. She's a physical therapist, um, doctor of physical therapy, and she's done some really great illustrations of good activities that frankly work really well, not just for skaters and dancers, but for anyone. Maintaining great alignment, using stripes in her clothing to demonstrate really well what she's doing. So you want to have balance, alignment, and strength Maintaining those good alignments during strength as world champion Kimmy Meissner shows. And so I hope what you've learned to do through this part of the talk is to observe clinically, to teach someone a little bit how to do things, and always, always give hope that things are going to be better because every person you saw in this had been told that they wouldn't be able to do what they wanted to do again. And they all did and did very well. So I want to thank John Patricios for thinking of me for this. Um, I'll have to say it's really fun to get to talk with all of you without um, necessarily traveling the 20 hours to be there. I don't think we had too bad background noise and the cat didn't jump into the picture. So I think we were pretty good. Um, so I thank you so much for the great times I did have in your beautiful country and also appreciate any children who joined in. Hoping we can meet some of you in the future all of you new friends. So we're going to go to Hene and to Robin for any questions about this part. I think Hene is going to be managing any questions on this section. Yes, thanks Angela. Thank you so much for your very wonderful presentation. So I do think we can all say we've learned a lot from your 10 commandments and I think it's very valuable in the clinical practice to use that. And I think especially remembering to always give hope and encouragement when you're working with a younger athlete. So thank you for sharing those with us and also the importance of posture and alignment. Um, we're gonna to go to a few Q and A's. Um, Angela, one of the first ones here, and you've also mentioned it, is that there in the last couple of years, the incidence of ACL injuries in children has increased quite a bit. 
So it's a two-part question. What is your thoughts on that? I know you've mentioned about the knees over toes and tennis, but I mean, there's a lot of other sports that we're seeing more and more ACL injuries happening. And then do you recommend any prehab programs or protocols like the FIFA 11 or anything like that that you can implement or use at schools or clubs? Yeah, I, it's a little bit of a two-part question, so let me answer the first part first. I think one of the main reasons for the lack of, um, lack of preparedness is that many children are specializing early, which we'll be talking about later, and so they've never acquired these gross motor skills. Um, one of the problems that we see ACL tears so much more in girls than in boys may be that girls don't jump out of trees anymore, that not many girls and boys in the U.S. climb trees anymore. I'm always so excited when somebody broke their arm because they fell out of a tree, because that means they climbed a tree. Um, but people don't have those type of landing patterns. So that's why we oftentimes are having to teach those landing patterns. And I think any of the programs that are designed to do that can help. Now, it's, it's important to know that when people have tried to look for the evidence for that, it is hard to find the evidence. Um, in fact, when the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons was putting together an ACL guidelines program, um, I think it's still the only one that's put together that the Academy did, the statistician said, you can't say that there are neuromuscular programs that will prevent this problem. And all of us in the fairly large group said, but there are, you have to be able to say this. And um, finally, there was some new evidence that came out during this two year discussion about this. Um, and I think it is very helpful. I think the FIFA 11 is a great start. I think however you do it, it's great. But of course, as you all know, the FIFA 11 aren't always being used by teams the way they're designed. And so you have to incorporate this really year round. And this is one of the benefits of perhaps of cross training, because if people aren't doing their own sport that they do all the time, maybe they'll be forced to learn it a different way because they've learned a way to compensate by their skill for what they do. But then they have these terrible positions and they cause these problems. Definitely, thank you, Angela. I also think now that we've gone into COVID, there's definitely something that we might need to look at and maybe as healthcare workers, what's our role in this time that the kids have not been on the field, not doing these patterns and not actually training, climbing trees, being outside, playing in the parks. Is there any recommendations or any advice you could maybe give as healthcare workers or how we can maybe almost encourage coaches, parents and educating them on this? Well, I think in the same way you've done such a great infographic on what to do with building healthy activity patterns for the preschooler. Um, it may be that you would find a country specific way to build some of these things in. But what I notice happening with dance, for example, in the US, and it may be happening, well, it's happening I know in some sports, is that we have classes by Zoom. And so the teacher can see the patterns, or the teacher or the coach can see the patterns that the child is doing. So maybe they're just jumping down the steps and almost everyone either has a step or can build a step or can jump off the bed or can jump up and down on the bed, which of course the little children love to do. And you can watch these patterns and see if they're managing to do them. Because I, my personal feeling is that being able to land right on two feet and being able to land right on one foot are the most critical patterns really for every sport but it involves knowing how to work the entire body, not just keeping your knee out of apparent valgus. And that's why I wanted to start with the toes because you really have to start there. Thanks, Were Angela. Were you barefoot? Were you barefoot, Hene? <laughs> yes, definitely. Angela, the next question is exactly on that. So someone's asked, what is your thoughts on using orthotics with children to correct or to almost facilitate that foot position, but you're still doing rehab, so it's not, completely replacing rehab. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I certainly have, I used to use orthotics an awful lot. And it, these days there are so many over-the-counter ones that work great that it's been a very long time. Um, I'd say the last five years of my practice that I prescribed orthotics, custom-made orthotics twice, twice. 
That's like almost never because we use so many of the over-the-counter available ones. Now, that being said, I use that mainly for people who are doing sports that, where they wear shoes. So many of our athletes either don't wear shoes or their shoes have so little structure that they can't hold an orthotic well. So trying to fit an orthotic into many of our soccer shoes, for example, doesn't work because the back of the shoe is so low that it lifts them out of the shoe. Um, so there they really need to learn like our dancers do and our gymnasts do to actually hold their foot up themselves. So I think the rehab part of that is critical. Um, but at least you can get rid of the short term, say patellofemoral problem by putting something in the shoe or making sure that the shoe is well aligned. But I think it's also important to get that foot strength early on when they're still younger, when they're allowed to be barefoot and play sport barefoot. Then when they're going to the older from 13 up, that if they need to be in shoes, at least they've got a base of having nice strength. So I do think rehab is really important for that. So yeah, I and I, I, I was amazed by one friend of mine who became an Alvin Ailey dancer when he was in his late teens. And before that, his father had been an Olympic judo coach in another country. Um, so he had what he called his judo feet that were very, very pronated, very flat. The entire foot contacted the mat. And he had his dancer feet that had arches. And it was very interesting to see that he could move from one to the other. Definitely. Thanks, Angela. We've got one more question left. Is just what is your opinion on active joint mobility exercises, such as functional range conditioning, especially in comparison to static stretching? Okay, somebody's going to have to explain to me exactly what you mean by the functional uh, motion. I think, I think what they're trying to say is that you need to probably have, I think it's probably the difference between doing static, stretch, strat, static stretches to get range, or should you be doing dynamic stretches more? And I think there's a lot of studies out on that, so with the yeah. difference. Well, here's going to be the same story that we're going to be hearing in the early sports specialization section. And that's that it is so sport dependent and child dependent. Mm -hmm. So I think we all know or suspect because the evidence is lacking that some of the best distance runners have terrible hamstring flexibility, for example. And maybe they're actually getting kinetic energy stored that way. And if you stretch out their hamstrings a lot statically, this is probably bad for them. But you cannot tell me that you can have an Olympic figure skater who is judged on their ability to do hyper stretch, split jumps, and then to instantly pull in and do a quadruple jump. They have to be able to have flexibility or they can't do that. So if they aren't stretching like a ballet dancer, which is doing some static stretching for a lengthy period of time a day, it doesn't seem to work. Now, when I say static stretching, I'm including PNF type stretching, I'm including pulsing type stretching, I'm including vibrational stretching. There are many different kinds of stretching that are going to fall into what I would consider static stretching, but the parts that are dynamic stretching, like part of a warm up, um, I don't think they're for everybody because I don't think that's sufficient for some sports. Definitely, thanks Angela. I'm going to give uh, thanks for all the answers. We're going to go straight into the early specialization um, in the panel discussion on that because I think it's quite a passionate and complex topic and to try and get all the coaches and parents and medical professionals in one boat on that is sometimes a bit hard. So we're going to jump right into that. Robin, you can take over from here. Angela, thank you for um, answering those questions. I think we could continue going for a long time, but we are running out of time. Um, briefly, we don't have much time to discuss the pros and cons of early sports specialization and your take on the matter. Well, I think it really is so dependent on the sport and the individual. For example, in tennis and gymnastics, in skating, figure skating, the skill level that are required are critical. And in gymnastics and in figure skating for the girls, the whole key is do you have a prepubertal body or not? I hate to say it, but that's true. And so some coaches will just try to keep the child prepubertal as long as possible. And that's why a long, long time ago, in I think 1991, we put together as part of the female athlete triad recommendations that the international governing bodies refuse to allow girls lower than age 16 to compete internationally or at the world championships. Um, now, of course, some girls have managed to stay until uh, age 16. And 
still have that prepubertal body, but they usually then fade quickly at 17 or 18, and in an Olympic cycle, they may no longer be a contender, which is tough. Um, but they need sometimes to have that early sports specialization to build the muscle that's needed, to build the bone that's needed. Um, in other sports, it doesn't matter. In other sports, they really benefit from that diversification. And when they're growing fast, a long time ago, one of the East, former East German um, PhDs told us that when kids were in their growth spurt, they measured them every month actually. And when they were in their growth spurt, they threw them into another sport. So they put the gymnasts out onto the tennis court. They put the soccer players into gymnastics. It was just interesting to watch this fruit basket turnover that they did. So lots of discussion, tough definitions, and I know we're not going to have time to go into the critical nature of really reading things, but I'm hoping that people will read the articles that we sent out. Um, if not, if we didn't get them, then please let us know and we'll send the references because understanding these definitions of what is really being used to define early sports specialization is critical. And in an area that's very, very hard to study, if you just read the abstract and the conclusion, you're probably going to be giving your patients incorrect data, in my opinion. Okay. I think one of the major issues with early sports specialization is the idea that it leads to lots of overuse injuries. Um, what is your take on that? I don't know. Okay. okay. And the reason I don't know is because there aren't data. And the reason that I can't trust the data is because the definitions don't make sense. Yes. Um, and I'm happy to send the next few slides to anybody who wants them, just because we're not going to have time to talk about them. But if you use Nero Gianthi's um, definition, which is being used broadly, um, he's a great guy. It's really hard to study this area. Um, you'll find that the same athlete, depending on what they do, they could be considered low specialization, moderate specialization, or high specialization. And so if you're using those data, yes. um, if you're using that definition to make your evidence, you can't build a conclusion that says, so higher degree of specialization, early specialization causes overuse injuries. It just, I don't think that argument holds water as it stands right now. Okay. Um, I've seen in some of the American um, guidelines, they talk about um, the, the child's age and the amount of time spent on exercise during the, during the week. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on that um, sort of overarching guideline? Boy, wouldn't it be nice if there were such an easy guideline? You know, and I, I use that one too. Um, but it's really tough. How do you decide that something is training for a sport or not? So the gymnast goes and spends five hours a week running. Well, is that added to their gymnastics training hours or not? Is it just the time they're jumping or not? Are they, you know, what is training? If they're spending time in ballet, maybe eight hours a week, is that gymnastics? I don't know how to answer that, and there aren't the data to tell me. Okay, fair enough. It is a very difficult subject. Um, I think uh, one, one question as um, physicians or physiotherapists or even parents that we should be looking at um, within um, parents who, I mean, in, within patients who might be beginning to what we would consider specialized too much. Is there any type of um, advice that we can give to, to parents, to patients, um, to um, physicians looking after these people, danger signs to look out for, um, and ways to deal with the issue? Yeah, and this may be surprising to many of the listeners, but when somebody comes to you with an overuse injury, the first thing you need to think about is, is there some sort of abuse going on? Now, abuse can be very wide ranging. Um, yes. Sometimes the athlete simply wants to be able to exit from the sport. Okay. So you have to think about that. They need an excuse to leave the sport. Um, sometimes they are being pushed into a situation that they don't know how to handle. And this can be from the parent, can be from the coach, can be from a medical professional, can be from the national governing body. Um, depending on the level of performance of the child, they may be 
being held accountable. Um, sometimes a whole country is putting pressure on one child, which is pretty scary to think about if you were that child. How do you deal with that? And some people will minimize their abuse injuries and they just won't tell anybody about them until they're horrible. Sometimes they'll say, I need to use this as my exit strategy to get out. They don't say it in that way, but that's what they're doing. And you need to recognize that that's their exit strategy. And that's one of the rare times that I actually ask the parent and the child if they would feel comfortable with my talking to the child themselves. But these days, that's really not possible because of the medical professional abuse issue. Okay. Sure. <laughs> it's it's a difficult subject. Um, it, it does become emotive. Um, I think we could spend a whole session just talking about this as well. Um, but unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. I'd like to um, finish by just um, thanking all of the, the participants. I'd like to share my screen um, just so that people can see some contact things and some things that are happening in the future. And then I'll hand over to John to wrap up. Um, so just... Uh, to be aware that we've got these interest groups going if people would like to get involved in the child athletes or the young athlete interest group they can email me that's my email address there and if people would like to get involved in the school sport interest group that's Hine's address over there and then finally just to punt um, a couple of the upcoming webinars that we have and i think angela this topic is going to be discussed further on friday um we we're going to hear from another international S expert about injuries in the young athlete. So join, join in for that um, if people are able to. And then next week, Wednesday, um, there's, there's a topic about bone health. So we've got lots going on at the moment. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have. I can give really pluses for both of them. I think Andrew and Kate will both be fabulous. So <laughs> you should definitely watch those. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, everyone. John, if you can give us some final thoughts. Yeah, well, firstly, thank you very much to Robin and Hene for chairing that session. It was an absolutely fascinating session. I love the interaction uh, between Catherine and, and Angela and the continuity from the very young age through to the adolescent. Uh, Catherine, thank you for representing South Africa so well and for such top quality research, which is so meaningful. I think that for me was the take home message there. It was really something that will make a difference to communities. And Angela, you know, as I, I, I always knew you would for your voice of experience coming through for making us remember that the basics are so important. Those, those tenets, the 10 commandments that we should always remember as clinicians and, and what a privilege it is to practice in this field, but also how complex it is to deal with these issues, particularly in children. Uh, in a competitive environment where parents are involved. We could have discussed this for a whole week, you know, and, and, and had enough uh, content to discuss. So thank you for really giving up your time. Uh, we appreciate, you know, what you've done for us and, and the ongoing relationship. And we're very, very grateful to both of you for, for giving up your time this evening. If you don't mind, we had a, a number of questions which we couldn't get to. If we could perhaps just email those and if you could maybe look at a couple of answers that would really, I think, be greatly appreciated by some of the people who, who listened in tonight. Um, and again, just to say what Robin mentioned, some superb talks coming up. I really would encourage you on um, Friday evening at four o'clock, we'll even allow you to pour a glass of wine a little bit earlier than usual and listen to Andrew Gregory, who will actually hone in on some of the injuries that we see in young athletes. And that will be following on very nicely from these two conversations which we had this evening. And then the conversation on bone health uh, next week, particularly relevant uh, to the women athlete, uh, is, is going to be fascinating as well. So look out for your emails, get onto the WISH website and look for what we have coming up. And uh, we really do appreciate you uh, tuning in. The CPD points will be forthcoming. Give us a little bit of time, have a bit of patience. It takes a while to get the certificates through, but if you did register, you will receive your certificate. So again, thank you to the speakers. Thank you to the chairs. Uh, and we wish you all a good evening. Thank you. Thanks very much. Super. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, everyone.